one of the great works for band that I, you know, that I have always loved and felt like I needed to perform it every, you know, four years or three years at the university was was the Hindemith Symphony because I felt like the students needed to have the, you know, an exposure to that work and and they because that's a traditional. You know, while it's a traditional piece, it's a great piece, too, you know. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now, my next guest, Tom Frisquillo. Hi, Tom. Hello. How are you, Mark? Thanks for joining me today. I'm really appreciative of your time. Well, it's my pleasure. So, Tom, um, I know that a lot of my guests and a lot of my listeners will know who you are, but could you take a moment and introduce yourself for my listeners? I am Tom Friscello. Uh I am uh, a retired band director. I am now the secretary treasurer of the American Band Masters Association, and uh, I taught for some 45, 46 years uh, in both public schools and university. And uh, my last position was at the University of Southern Mississippi, uh, from which I retired in 2012. And uh, I moved to Georgia because uh, we live just, my wife and I live just north of Atlanta in, the, uh, in a uh, community called Big Canoe, which is in the in the mountains of uh, Georgia. And uh, it's it's not far from Atlanta, but we moved here because my son went to Georgia Tech. When he graduated from Georgia Tech, we knew that he was not, you know, ever coming back to uh, his family home in New Orleans or, you know, where we were living in Hattiesburg, uh, Mississippi. And so uh, uh, he found a position here and we thought, well, if we ever want to see him again, we should move to, to Georgia, you know? So that's where we live now in big canoe, Georgia. So Tom, can you tell the listeners about your childhood? How did you get your start in music and what instrument did you play? Like, how did that all happen? Uh, my, my grandparents were Italian immigrants. My father was born shortly after they came to the United States and, uh, my mother was an American and, and, uh, uh, she, of course, <laughs> came from more affluence than my father <laughs> uh, because my grandparents were just farmers, you know, and uh, my Italian grandparents were. But my mother had a piano. Uh, we had a piano in our home, and it was her piano, and she played the piano. And, and so I always wanted to play the piano. And so uh, uh, I... Uh, did not have a piano teacher. Uh, she, of course, did not have the pedagogical skills to teach me to play the piano. And uh, I mean, she would teach me little things, but you know, nothing of of, of, of great importance. Uh, so uh, I, I went to uh, Catholic school because, you know, in those days, that was the thing. If, if you were Catholic, that's what you did. You went to Catholic school. And so when I went to Catholic school, uh, I begged my parents to let me take piano, and that was the only <laughs> extra extra activity that you could do. I mean, it was it was uh, there were no other things. There were no sports, no band, no anything except you could take piano. You know, so I took piano from a very good teacher, uh, Sister Norbert Mary, and I took piano from her from the oh goodness, from the second grade until the eighth grade, and then uh, I 
studied then with the wife of the uh, high school band director. But as I, let me finish this story. Um, uh, I at the end at, in the the school only went to the eighth grade to, to finish the eighth grade, and then we had to go to public school. Well, when I went to public school, I was absolutely lost in the ninth grade. There were no. Uh, you know, I had no friends. I knew n absolutely no one. Uh, I came from a very small environment uh, in which there were probably 30 children in the class, maybe 30 children, if, if I remember correctly. And, you know, I was just completely lost. And uh, one day, however, just serendipitously, uh, we had an assembly program uh, and uh, the band played on the program. And I thought, that is the neatest thing. I want to be a part of that. And so I just went down to, to the uh, principal's office. In those days, we didn't have counselors where you signed up for a counselor. You just went down and told them what you wanted to take the next year, you know. So I went down and, and uh, told the principal I wanted to, to be in the band. I mean, I told the secretary I wanted to be in the band. She said, okay, I'll sign you up for band. So this was going into the 10th grade. And so uh, the uh, band director called me up in the summer and he said, my name is Kent Sills. And he said, uh, I'm the new band director in town. And he was the new band director. The other one who had given the assembly program had retired. And so he said, uh, I'm getting all the band students together here. And I said, now let me stop you right there, uh, Mr. Sills. I said, uh, I've never been in the band before. And he said, yeah, well, I see that you had, had not, I, that you didn't have it on your, you know, it was, wasn't on your record or anything. And he, he said, well, do you play an instrument? And I said, well, the only instrument I play is the piano. And he said, well, he said, great. He said, why don't you come up to the band hall and we will see what we can put you, what instrument we can find for you to play. And so I got on my bicycle and I rode three blocks to the band hall, you know, and because uh, I live in a small town in northern community. And uh, Kent uh, found uh, that uh, the the most uh, advantageous instrument, you know, instruments for me to play were the percussion instruments. And certainly they were because I played, uh, you know, I could play the mallet instruments. I mean, taking piano forever. I, I could play the mallet instruments easily. And then the snare drum wasn't so easy for me, but, uh, uh I, that's how I, I didn't, I didn't get in the band until I was in the 10th grade. And I like to say that, uh, you know, he was a great influence on my, uh, on my career and on, on everything that I did because he guided me through the process and, uh, was was really a, a great mentor. So that's how I got started in the band business, you know. And of course, that was 19, oh gosh, 1962, maybe. You know, that's a long time ago. But I don't doubt that there were a lot of young people at that time, you know, who were in Catholic schools that did not have band programs or parochial schools of some sort, private schools who did not, that did not have band programs. And uh, they needed, you know, if, if that's how they got started in some, in another way. So at any rate, that's how I got started in the band. Yeah. And so when you, when you were in the high school band and when you, you sort of started the percussion, you started in 10th grade, which is very late, as we all know. When did you know that you were going to go and study music beyond high school? Well, I found I really found a home, you know, with that. And I got really, really interested in it almost immediately. And uh, I guess maybe when I was in the 11th grade, you know, because uh Kent, uh, the band director, really kind of mentored several of us who were, who were, you know, he felt had talent. And, and I, I really kind of I took off on the instrument and uh, went to several, you know, uh, clinics and several, you know, uh, things in, in the state that were all state band. I auditioned for that and actually made it, you know. So uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, that that's when I decided in the eleventh grade I got really really interested in doing that and and so uh, then I met uh, 
Kent introduced me to Bill Moody. And uh, Bill was the director of bands at the University of Southern Mississippi, where I later taught. And uh, Bill Moody became a great friend of mine and a great mentor, uh, William J. Moody. And uh, Bill and I remained friends until he passed away this last year. So can, can you mention the, the name of the town you grew up in again? Uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi. Clarksdale, Mississippi. And so what was your experience like at the at the University of Southern Mississippi as an undergraduate? Were you a music ed major? Yes, uh, I was a music ed major and uh I you know, I I had a very good experience. It was a, it was a, it has been and is uh a, a very good music school. The uh School of Music had, I don't remember how many students, but it seemed awfully big to me at that time, you know. But they, they, uh, they, Bill Moody was the director of bands, and Ray Young was the associate director of bands. And Ray Young was a Michigan grad and was Ravelli's uh, uh, euphonium soloist on the, on the uh, Russia tour. And so uh, that, now that's a long time before your I mean, you don't even know what I'm talking about, probably. <laughs> uh, uh, I, since I played the piano, and I played, you know, I, I accompanied really pretty well. I have to, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I, that, was, that was my forte. I was not a soloist by any means, but I could, you know, I could accompany well, and I could, I, I, because I was an instrument, you know, I, I played in the band, I kind of understood what instrumentalists needed. And so uh, Ray took me under his wing as well, and, and I often accompanied him, and we made uh, several recordings. Uh, Bill Gower was on the faculty of uh, the Gower family from Iowa, from the University of Iowa. And uh, Bill uh, Bill also kind of took me under his wing, and I helped. Uh, I, I played for him, you know, and, and so... You know, there there were a lot of people there on the faculty that were really, uh, really uh, influential in my in my uh, career and in in you know my becoming a band director and a music educator. Is there something that you take from either your high school band director or one of your college experiences that you can remember using in your own career as a as a director or a teacher? Well, I think from uh, from Kent Sills, I just take that it was. Uh, you know, hard work. You know, he 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 was a very very uh, uh, devoted and diligent person, and uh, worked very very very. Uh, anyway, he worked very hard at his craft. And and from from uh, from Bill Moody, I think I just learned uh, a basic uh, uh, need to 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 keep learning, you know, and, and to, uh, Bill was, was, a, a real scholar in many ways. And, and he always encouraged us to continue, you know, to study, to continue learning, to read and to, uh, you know, uh, he, Bill was the first person that I ever knew that was a, a real, you know, a real, uh, intensive scholar and one who, who actually, uh, you know, actually, read and 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 was uh was quite intelligent so at any rate uh that's what i can tell you that i took from those people yeah kent sills went on to have a career uh, in higher education correct yes uh -huh. he taught at mississippi state university and uh uh bill moody left the university of southern mississippi and went to the university of texas and then he went to uh from there Bill, he got interested in, in administration there. They, uh, they were interested in him as an administrator at Texas, and so uh, that's kind of a large, all, you know, kind of engulfing university. And so it, they, uh, he then went there to the University of South Carolina as the director of the School of Music. So, uh, but Kent, Kent had a long career at, at uh at Mississippi State until he retired due to health issues and uh, passed away some years ago. I, I can't remember the year now, but uh, he, uh, um, Kent was a good friend, and, and he and his, wi his wife still is. I mean, uh, 
we uh, talk occasionally, you know. So, at any rate. Tom, so one of the other things you mentioned is that you didn't necessarily feel like you had a great place when you moved to, into the public schools and that the band came along and it seemed like something that could give you a place. Is, is that, am I mischaracterizing that? That's true. It gave me a home. And, and as, a, as having been a high school band director, I saw that a lot. I mean, with, with, with all of my, with many, many of my students. I mean, they, many of them loved music and enjoyed playing their instruments and studied really hard and, and practiced, you know, but the band was, was, uh, it was home base. I mean, you know, it was, it was a place where they found, uh, you know, they found friends, they found, uh, you know, it was, it was really their, their, uh, their, their reason for coming to school in many ways, even though they were not going to be music majors, you know, uh, it was, it was really, uh, the base for their, their, their existence in public in high school, you know? So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it, it gave me a real home for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm, a lot of my guests say the same thing. I mean, for me, I ate most of my lunches in the band room throughout high school. Uh, yeah, without question. Yes, indeed. So what do yeah. we what do we do as directors and teachers to help foster that sense of community in our groups? Is there is there anything that you can think of? I, I think you try to be a, a, a good role model, you know, and you try to have your door open when, you know, uh, at lunchtime. Uh, the rest of the day, my wife, my wife was my assistant when we, we taught it at, at the same high school. And uh, uh, we. Uh, we uh, taught lessons the rest of the day because that was a, a, during a period of time that you could, you know, students could come to the, the band hall and, and take a private lesson during the day. They were, they were, they had a, a study hall period or, or they had an off period, you know, because we were on a seven period day at that time. But no, I, I, uh, if I'm, I, I've kind of lost track here now, but, but fostering, fostering that I think is, is to be, you know, open and to be, uh, uh, you know, to, to try to be the best role model you can be for them and to be an interesting character for them and to, to, uh, to, to always, uh, you know, always be the person to whom they can come if they need to, you know. So uh, we, my wife and I both tried to teach uh, music first and then, to be uh, a good person second, you know, uh, or, or alongside with that. I don't want to be second, no, <laughs> to, but to be a good person at the same time, you know. So, I mean, ethics is a very important thing with, you know, and so I, I think that uh, that's one of the things that we always try to foster among, among our students. Sure. Can you tell me about um, Meridian High School and your time there? Well, I went to Meridian High School at a very difficult time for the public schools in the Deep South. And uh, the uh, integration had happened in 1969, and I went there in 1975. And uh, the, uh, you know, students were, were the, the school was about, you know, 50% African American, 50% uh, uh, white, and it was uh, uh, difficult because there were many people who didn't want to be there on both sides of the fence. Uh, they wanted to be back at their old school, and they didn't want, you know, this crowd to be there or that crowd. So what we tried to do with the band, what Cecilia and I tried to do with the band, was we tried to make the band a place of harmony, a place where students could could uh, come and uh, be together in Melbourne, where everybody had the same opportunity, you know, where if, if you were African-American, you could be the first year clarinetist, just like you could be, uh, just like the white child could be the first year clarinetist, you know, it, it, it was a uh, uh, that was one of the things about Meridian High School. Plus, we had a very good uh, support group there. The superintendent was enormously supportive of the of the band program. The principal was very supportive of the band program. And uh, when we uh, in 1980, when we played at the Midwest, the principal uh, Artie Harris uh, was uh, 
uh, so supportive that he allowed us to have some sectionals during the day, you know, because as you know, the Midwest is a difficult task to pull off because you have to do it in the fall and, you know, you, you have to, <laughs> you have marching band, you have a lot of other stuff that, you know, that on in the fall. And so, uh, uh, RD was very supportive. And so we had a great experience there. We had great students and uh, some wonderful players, some that went on to be band directors, went on to be music educators in other areas, uh, some that uh, didn't but still stay in touch with us. In fact, we have some that come to see us every year uh, at Christmas time here in Big Canoe, who were our students, you know, in 19, I don't know, 1980, 1979. And uh, they come with their wives, and we visit and go out to dinner. And so it's a, you know, it, it was a, it was a great place to live. It was a nice community in, the, in those days. Uh, I have not been back there, but I do talk to several people often from there, and uh, whose children were in my band there, and uh, they were very appreciative of, you know, of what I, what you know, Cecilia and I try to do, and. Uh, uh, I still, one was a, a, a pediatrician who probably took care of everybody's child in the band, in, in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in town, you know, in, in the band for sure. And, and, uh, uh, John used to tell me, he'd say, you know, uh, the band is responsible for, for some really great things. And he said, it's responsible for some really <laughs> psychological problems for children as well. <laughs> sure can be. <laughs> what do you mean by that, John? He said, well, some of them just feel like they can't achieve. And I said, well, you know, uh, we work on it. And uh, so at any rate, there were a couple who were you know, like that, but, but not many, but he, he jokes about that all the time. But John, John and I visit every now and then he and his wife, uh, uh, live in North Carolina. No, they live in Tennessee now. So at, at any rate, uh, then, then, uh, Bill Moody called me one day and he said, you know, you need to start working on a doctorate. And, uh, probably like you, you know, there came a time in your life when you decided, well, you know, if I'm going to make more money or am I'm, if I'm going to, you know, do something else. I'm going to advance in this, this world, this profession. I need to work on a, you know, go back and get an advanced degree. And so Bill called and I went back to the University of South Carolina and got my doctorate and then went to the University of Southern Mississippi. So, and taught there for 28 years. Yeah, there's a lot in there. So tell me about your program at the University of Southern Mississippi. I know, as I mentioned when we first started to talk, that many of my listeners and former guests have mentioned that I should speak with you. And so can you tell me about your time there? Well, when I went there, uh, 1984, I went there. Uh, the program was, the, there had been, uh, uh, Joe Barry Mullins had been there for many, many years. Well, not many, many years, but he'd been there for a significant number of years. And uh, then they had had an interim band director. And so, you know, it was the same kind of thing. It was kind of a rebuilding thing. And, and, and uh, uh, Joe Barry uh, had done a really good job for them and was highly thought of. And uh, then when he retired, there was an interim and, and the, the faculty is, you know, with many faculties at various places, they, they were not well happy with him. And so uh, uh, he, he left. And, and so uh, I came in. And so we had to, you know, we had to do some pretty serious uh, work on, on rebuilding things. And, and then you know, it was it was a very fertile place to work in many ways because we 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 drew from uh, the metropolitan area of New Orleans. We drew from all of that area, the swath of South Louisiana that goes all the way over to Lake Charles, Louisiana. We had many students. I, I recruited a lot of students from Lafayette, Louisiana, and then we had all of the Panhandle of Florida in which there were many band directors uh, that had who had graduated from Southern Miss. And so, I mean, it was 
we, we would get students. It was not necessarily a, a state university. It was more a regional university, you know. There were there were many students. While we we had a lot of students from Mississippi in the band program, we, we had a lot of students from Florida and, and Alabama and, uh, uh you know, the Mobile area and, and many from the New Orleans and and all the way over, as I told you, to Lake Charles. And so uh, it was it was uh, it was an interesting, interesting place to work. And then we had a really, you know, quite uh, a really good faculty. Gosh, we had a saxophone teacher uh, who's still there, by the way. I ask him all the time when he's going to retire. But Larry used to recruit, you know, all over the country. He was he was a uh, Sigurd Rasher devo- uh, student, and uh, he uh, would recruit students from, you know, Fredonia, New York, <laughs> and Fredonia, and, and places like that. And, and so, you know, we had we had a lot of graduate students uh, from various places that the faculty would help recruit, and uh, I would generally help them, uh, you know, <clears throat> find funding for that. And so it was, it was, you know, I can't say that every day was enjoyable, but, <laughs> and I can't say that I got along with every faculty member, but I can say that the majority of them I did. And I can say that the band, the, the wind ensemble, the symphonic winds, we called it, and the concert band were all really good bands. And, uh, you know, we tried to provide in each, each group uh, a really good experience for students, regardless of whether they were music ed students or performance majors or, you know, non-music ed students. So, uh, it was, it was a good place to work. Yeah. You know, I, I did my doctorate at Florida state and oh, so yeah. I've had a lot of people on this show who, who come from Florida state or the university of Alabama or Southern Mississippi. And what is it about music ed in the Southeast that is so intense and creates these big programs? Is there something you know, I think band programs are really have been strong there for many years in the panhandle of Florida. And I think down through Florida, the leadership has been really good, you know. And so uh, I think that, you know, uh, Lewis Jones was the head of the, the uh, Florida Band Directors Association for many years and, uh, you know, promoted, uh, a, you know, a really good environment. Uh, I think that uh, Mississippi, even though it's a small environment, had a lot of really, you know, good little bands through through, uh, and and Louisiana as well. Uh, I think it was. I think first of all, there were some people in universities many years ago who promoted the band programs and promoted uh, and and put band directors out in schools. You know, so that. And, you know, you got, you have to, in, in Alabama, one of the great leaders in Alabama from, for many years was John Long. And John Long went to a little bitty school, Troy State University, that probably didn't have 1,500 students when he went there. And, and he recruited uh, students to come there and study in music education. And he put those people in little schools all over Alabama, and they built band programs you know, and uh, the band programs now flourish, you know. Uh, the, of course, towns have grown. Mobile has grown. Birmingham has grown. You know, there, there are many. Jackson, Mississippi has grown. Uh, a lot of the Gulf Coast of Mississippi has some really good band programs on it now. Uh, uh, and uh, so, I mean, the, I, I think if Bill Moody put out some really good band directors who started programs and kept programs going. And, and I, I think that has something to do with it. It was a leadership some 40 years ago that, uh, 40, 50 years ago, you know, that, uh, that in, in the 1960s that, that had a great deal to do with, with people, you know, Jim Croft at, the, at, at Florida state, you know, had a lot to do with the, the promotion of music education in, in that state. So, uh, you know, uh, that's my opinion. Yeah, it's just, it's remarkable that, you know, the band world is becoming less regional, but there is certainly a regional flavor to it still. Yeah, there is. I mean, if you go to Illinois, there's certainly a regional flavor. And then you know, Indiana. I mean, we, uh, the, I was uh, at, at, at 
the physical therapy the other day, and the lady who uh, is a physical therapist works at the physical therapist's office is, is a Purdue grad. And, and I told uh-huh. her, well, you know, it's kind of strange to have a Purdue grad down here, you know. Uh, her husband obviously have found a job in Atlanta, and uh, that's the way she told me they moved here. And uh, so she, uh, she uh, uh, was in the high school band, you know, and uh, she tells me about going to the uh, national band contest in, in Indiana and uh, going to the, you know, the uh, national marching band or the not national band contest, but the, uh, the, the, the state band contest where they, they rank, you know, I don't know whether they still do that or not because I don't keep up with that, but they, they ranked at one time. I judged that, that festival, it wasn't a festival, it was a contest. They they ranked the bands. They were like fifteen to twenty bands, and they wanted you to rank them one through twenty. And I thought, God, this is going to be impossible. You know, do this. So anyway, I mean, there things are different, and but I think the one thing that's made things uh, maybe more cohesive, you know, certainly is the internet. Another thing that's made it more cohesive is music for all. Uh, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of things, uh, those kinds of, you know what I mean, those kinds of organizations. So I just find the regionalism interesting having, cause I, when I taught high school band, I taught in California, uh, on the central coast in the San Francisco area. And it's just one director, one band there. That's all it is. It's, you know, smaller programs. That is pretty regional though. I mean, when, once you pass, once you pass the Mississippi River, I mean, once you, well, not let's say the Mississippi River, but once you get to New Mexico and, and to the West, you know, things become very different. And I, I, I say that because in, in the American Bandmasters Association, uh, it, it is, there, there are fewer schools out there, you know, not in California, but like in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, you know, Washington. There, there are just fewer, fewer skills, fewer school, schools, fewer, you know, less population. I once did a program in, I did a clinic, a summer a music clinic in, uh, for Eckroth Music Company in, in uh, North Dakota, and uh, there were band directors there from Montana and from all over. And I said, well, gosh, why are you here? You know, I didn't. I didn't understand. They they were buying music for the whole year. You know, and and uh, one man explained to me. He said, "Well, you know, once it starts to snow in Montana, you just you have to you you have a limited this limited space. You know, to, you can't get around very well. So mm-hmm. you you've got to uh, you you have to uh, uh, buy everything now. You know, mm-hmm. so uh, it was." Uh, there, there just aren't very many schools. I mean, there, there. How many people live in North Dakota? Five hundred thousand. So I don't. <laughs> yeah, it's small. Well, we have eight million people live in Atlanta. You know, it's so it's uh, it's a very different different environment. And California is is very different. You know, it is. I will have to. Say, yeah, very very different. And it's it's very even California is regional because the bands in Southern California are very different than the band programs in Northern California. Indeed, yeah. And, you know, in New Mexico, there are, uh, you know, if you go to uh, uh, Las Cruces, uh, you know, if you, the universe, uh, what's New Mexico State down in that area, there there are, you know, some good bands. But then if you get up north of Albuquerque, they're, they're, the bands are very different. I mean, you know, they're very, uh, they have a very different flavor. There'll be a lot of guitars in them, you know, there, there'll be a lot of non wind instruments you know what i mean just due to the uh to the to the regional you know uh uh hispanic uh culture so at any rate tom can you tell me about your work in italy and what you're doing with the bands there well i worked my first time to work there was 1996 or 7 i think i can't remember now but it was i remember my son was about five, six years old. So it might've been a few years before might, he was born in 89. So it might've been, you know, 94, 95, uh, that the first time to work there. 
and it was at uh, uh, doing a uh, conducting workshop in in a little town in Guarna in northern Italy. And uh, I often say that I, I don't know that I'm that talented at what I do, but because I speak Italian, they find it easy to hire me. You know, uh, yeah, the 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 but I, I've worked I worked there in Guarna, and just through meeting people. From there and uh, working down uh, in Italy uh, throughout the the uh, the country, uh, one of my good friends is Fulvio Cru, who was the conductor of the Italian Army Band for many years. And Fulvio and I used to to work together a lot. Uh, he would have me over to conduct, and I would have uh, uh, him over to conduct, and uh, we would I would do. Conducting workshops where they would get, uh, it, it, they were more like band director workshops. Uh, uh, that in Italy they want to study the, they want to study things more. You, you said you taught music theory. Uh, they want to study a score from a theorist aspect more than from the aspect that we study in the United States. You know. And, uh, I mean, we, we study the instrumentation more, you know, a uh, conducting aspect. And whereas they want to know the harmonic, uh, you know, background, they want to know, you know, about the composer, which is a good thing. You know, I, I think, uh, maybe, maybe we don't do enough of that here in the United States, but, uh, I've worked in Sicily for Alfio Zito many times where we had, you know, a, a room that was really hot because they don't believe in air conditioning. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. it, would, it would be really hot, and there would be eight or ten band directors in there, and they would come from all over, all over Italy because they, they wanted to learn. Because, they, they, in, I mean, in Italy, if you want to be a musician, you go to the conservatory. And uh, uh, if you want to be a musicologist, you go to uh, a university. And uh, so if you, in, in, in the conservatory, conducting or band directing uh, music education just doesn't exist. Uh, uh, the, so, I mean, it exists a little more now. They're, they've given some lip service to it now, but uh, not a great amount. Uh, so if you want to be a, you know, a teacher, uh, and, and there aren't, there's no music in the schools either. So if you want to be if you want to be a band director, you have to find a little band to work with. You know, uh, one of my graduate students from Southern Miss, Armando Salarini, lives in uh, uh, just outside Milan in a little town called Triujo, and he has several bands that he conducts. In fact, he bought brought his band to the Midwest last year, uh, Bazana, the band from Bazana Brianza, and uh, uh, he. It's it's just a community band, basically, you know. So, there, I mean, music education is a very different thing there. It's much like it was in the days. If I could, if I could encourage people, your listeners, to to go anywhere, is to go to the ABA website and to find and, and to look at the uh, the uh, the. Uh, uh, or go to the University of Maryland website, the ABA archives, and look at the oral history that uh, Don Gillis did with people like Carl King and Ferdy Grofe and people like that. Uh, uh, Carl King explained the band movement in the United States and how he learned to play an instrument. And he learned to play an instrument simply in the town band. And that's basically the way they learned still to play in in. Uh, in Italy. And so, you know, my, my work, uh, they wanted me to come, I, my wife and I just returned from Italy in, uh, uh, the first of June. And, uh, they wanted us to come back in August to do, uh, a forum. It's, uh, 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 kind of a, you know, a round table discussion of European band directors, not necessarily, band directors from just from Italy, but from the Netherlands and from Spain and from places like that. And, and, uh, I, I, I couldn't do it because I have several other, uh, obligations. One of which is, you know, several family obligations that I just had to back out. And so I, uh, uh, encouraged them to hire Lowell Graham. So 
I don't know whether they've done that or not, but I, I haven't talked to Lowell lately. Um, hopefully they did. He's free. He said he was free. So anyway, that's my involvement in Italy. And I, I you know, I still, if, if, you know, I, I'm, I'm not as youthful as I once was and, and, uh, travel is, you know, travel is not easy. Uh, and while we live here with one of the largest airports in, in, you know, as far as passion, passenger uh, movement during the day, probably the largest airport in the United States. Uh, the uh, and and you know it's fairly easy to travel through the Atlanta airport, but once you get to the other airports, it's especially you know in Italy or you know France or Germany. I, I have been going to the International Wind Society uh, with a friend and his wife. And my wife and I have been going to that in the summers, and that's been really interesting. Although a lot of the papers are given, it's a musicological society on, on you know, the history of wind and uh, wind instruments and music education in Europe and, and uh, things like that. But uh, the unfortunate thing about some of the lectures is that they're in German, and <laughs> the only thing I can do is read, read the... Uh, you know, read the, the, the overview that's in the program because I don't speak a word of German. I mean, nothing. So I'm lost there. But at any rate, uh, I try to get my, my Italian friends, my Italian students uh, to go to go to that. It's I-G-E-B, uh, the uh, E-G-E-B, and uh, the, that it's... Uh, it's I, I don't know what it is in in German, but anyway, it's it's a, the International Wind Society. If if you just Google it, you could find it. But uh, it, it's a, a very good you know it, it's a very good uh, 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 forum for for music and and for for wind music in Europe uh, and the history of wind music as well. If you're interested in that, so. sure, sure. This is interesting. I um I found the. Uh the collection at the university of Maryland. This oh, is good. fascinating to see that who interviewed. We have John Painter, yeah. Willi- William Ravelli, uh, Vaslov. Uh, it's really wonderful. And, and, uh, you know, um, um, Vin Navarro, Vincent Navarro, Navarra, excuse me, at, at the university of Maryland is a curator there. And, and, uh, he, uh, he's just wonderful. He really, really is wonderful. And, uh, the, the ABA archives, uh, I mean, if, if it, it is the most used archive in all of the archives that they have there, and they have a lot of archives and uh, for various organizations in the United States. And it's the most used for graduate students who are doing work in music education and, you know, uh, music in general. So uh, ABA members, you know, uh, put uh, send their, their uh, you know, their, their, their work, their you know what they have. Uh, you know what they what sure. what they have. Like my my, I've sent a lot of stuff that I had at the university that that you know I felt would be in, that people could use somehow. You know in 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 research. Uh, Harry Beejan was a good friend of mine, and and uh, several of the scores that Harry sent me, he had uh, Carol Husa had sent to Harry and. Harry, uh, when when he retired from Illinois, he uh, signed them for me and sent them to me, and uh, uh, you know, and they were signed by Carol Husa to him. And so, uh, I, you know, it was it, it's hard to give up those things because you don't want to, but but it, but pos, you know, posterity needs to have those because you know uh, Harry Beechin was a very important band director in the United States. All right. So let me ask you a question, maybe a takeaway for the listener. And uh, you mentioned that how things are different in Italy. Is there something that you learned um, conducting overseas that maybe we can take back to the bands here? Well, I learned nonverbal communication, that's for sure, with many people, especially, you know, because uh, my my Italian is, is really quite good. I, 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 I'm you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm bragging a little bit, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm quite fluent, but, uh, when you have to use, uh, uh, when, when we stand in front of an ensemble in the United States, we speak, you know, 
from the heart. We speak fluently. We speak, uh, you know, quickly. But uh, when when you're when you're in front of an ensemble in Italy, you really and you stop and you say, "All right, I, I would like for this to happen." You know, then you have to think about what you're going to say. You know, uh, because you may not be asking for the for what you know what you really want. Uh, so I think uh, I, I think nonverbal communication is very important. I think that uh, we should we should work on that as as a conductor uh i think that um that's one of the big things that i learned uh there and one of the big things that that, that when we brought students i took students from the united states over there a good bit fulvio and i would do a little conducting workshop with the italian army band he was very gracious to let me do that and and of course these stu- those students didn't speak any italian you know uh and so they uh they went and uh, they had to. Uh, of course, there there were a number of people in the band who you know who spoke uh, uh, English, but but not fluently. You know, so they had to learn that when you conducted, you had to give. You know, you had to be more succinct than just you know, uh, as as we often do, uh, uh, not not worry necessarily about being. You know, clear and direct, and being uh, giving cues and and you know those kinds of things with conductors, and with with musicians. So that's probably the biggest thing that I learned over there. Uh, the 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 other thing that I learned is that 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 those with with many of those groups, I mean, many of them are really really quite good. You know. Uh, and especially the Italian Army Band is a is a professional group. It's like one of our you know one of our groups in Washington. Uh, and and you really I mean you really can't be uh, you really cannot you you must be on your toes. You know you you must know what you're doing. Otherwise they know that you know don't know what you're doing. And if they know that you don't know what you're doing, you're really in trouble. You know. <laughs> So uh, it, it's I, I learned that I mean you really really must be prepared you know uh, that to to know the score to know it well that that you can you know be be ready to go and 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 you know when you get on the podium you can be succinct with the baton and so forth so you know uh, they, they you know the my my career has has been really. Uh, uh, Italy has been a, a very, very, uh, very wonderful thing for me. I'm, I have some great friends there, and and uh, in Rome, uh, especially. Uh, my family lives uh, just outside of Naples, and so we go and see them. Uh, and actually, my 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 cousin Giuseppe, his wife's uh, nephew is is a bassoonist, a professional bassoonist in uh, Rome, in in uh, one of the military bands. And so, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people from southern Italy are musicians. They they uh, they find work as musicians in in the military ensembles in Rome. And uh, so, you know, it, it is a way for them out of out of uh, you know out of poverty and out of out of uh, the little town that they came from. So, at any rate, yeah, my um. My grandmother emigrated from Italy, and her brother, Marco, who I was named after, was a, a tenor horn player in the turn of the century. Ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were yeah. from uh, from Calabria, the very southern. Yeah, I, yeah. my grandmother, well, it's close to, I have worked in Calabria, uh, and it's, it's a very, very different part of Italy. Yes, yes. it is, indeed. indeed. Indeed, very dry, very uh, desertist almost, you know. Mm-hmm, sure. But it's quite beautiful. I mean, the coastline is absolutely, really, really beautiful, you know. But once you leave Naples and go south, it becomes very, a very different part of the world, you know. You get over to Matera and those parts of Italy, uh, over, you know, the other side, you know, and, and it, it's it's very different. So at any rate, it's also very, very poor, you know. Uh, 
And but I mean, they, it's just not industrial like the northern part of Italy is. The northern part of Italy is much like the United States. I ask these final questions of all my guests, and they, they're they're big, broad hypotheticals, so you can answer them the way you see fit. Yeah. Okay, and the first of these is, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Let me put this in a very um, diplomatic way. You know, I think that. Overemphasis on competition and driving students to just the brink of, of insanity uh, is, is where I draw the line. You know, there are ensembles that, that I know that will, will rehearse, for example, the marching band will rehearse forever and ever and ever and ever. And uh, for what reason? I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, now I can be very, you know, I can surely be criticized for that statement. But I don't understand. I don't understand that. You know, I didn't grow up in that, 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 that milieu, that 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 environment. And so I, I don't understand how. What what's the purpose? You know. So I I draw the. Uh, the 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 uh, the line at that, uh, but that when you when you really really drive and drive and drive. Now I think that festivals are are not. I think those are are healthy. I think that it's a really good thing for for bands, orchestras to be evaluated every year. I think it's a good thing for students to to look forward to that. I think it's a good thing for them to prepare a program very carefully. You know. But I think when you when you when you drive it in the ground and you start you start that music you know uh, a year in advance you know say that the end of when you start music for the next year's uh, uh, competition in May you know or people I, I belong to a, a, a chat room that that not a chat room but a, a Oh, I don't know what you call it—a listserv, you know. That that uh, band directors will start, you know, buying props and start this kind of thing for their show in March for the next year, you know. And I think, what in the world are you doing, you know? That uh, I, I, that's where I draw the line, you know. And I'm I'm really pretty opinionated about that, and and I have many many friends who are. And so I feel like I'm on the right side of the law, you know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so at any rate. So, Tom, how have you found a work-life balance in your career? Well, my wife and I, it took us a long time. We had, uh, we, we uh, decided that, uh, you know, that uh, we wanted to have children, but we had worked. I mean, we were working a long time, and finally uh, we decided, well, you know, we need to have, we would like to have a family, and so it it, it took us a long time to decide. Uh, so I, I just decided, I made the decision, and she did too, that uh, if my my I, one of the people that helped me a lot with that was my secretary, Linda Kelly who was one of the dearest people I ever knew. And uh, Linda, Linda and I retired pretty much at the same time. And she, Linda's husband was quite ill, you know, and, and Linda made me understand and, and was ill for a long time. And she had to try to work. She had to try to take care of him. And Linda, Linda uh, uh, made me understand that, that, you know, there were, things in your life, in your personal life, that were very important, that you really, really had to take care of. And so she, uh, uh, I just, she would say, all right, Dr. Verskillo, it's uh, five o'clock, it's time to leave, you know, or as soon as you finish with Win Ensemble at 5.30, you need to go home, you know, uh, this work or this will wait until tomorrow. And so basically, I think I just made the decision and my wife made the decision that uh, our son, we only have one child, our son came first and in, in certain things. And, you know, if, if, if he were ill, I would stay home. Uh, 
probably because it was easier for me to stay home than my wife was a middle school band director when we taught in Hattiesburg. Uh, so, uh, you know, at, at the university and, and when she taught it, she taught in the middle school there in, in the city. So that's, that. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Some people can't do that. And I, I think it's, it's very difficult for band directors, particularly because it's such a demanding job, you know, it really, really is. Uh, Weekends and but but you just have to find a balance and you have to say okay how many of these uh, you know there there are bands that go they start I had a I had a lady ask me I was doing a clinic in Tennessee once and she asked me she was a percussion teacher at this university uh, where I was teaching and uh, where I was working and and I was doing a uh, you know a clinic and she was there and she said. What would you say if your son or daughter uh, had their first marching band contest uh, September the 12th, and they went until November uh, doing marching band contest? I said, what I would say is my son or daughter would not be in the band. And, and uh, I mean, all the air sucked out of the room, but uh, it, it, it sucked out of the room because I really feel that, I mean, people have, a, I mean, children have a life. They have family. They have grandparents. They have aunts and uncles. I mean, you know, there, there is there is another part of life than just work and, and competition like that. Why? For what reason do we do that? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know. This is a big and broad question, but you can pick maybe one or one thing that you think is most important. But what are the challenges facing music education, and how can we best meet it? The, I think that one of the great challenges now is 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 uh, the overemphasis on competition, and then then the 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 other thing that that just drives me crazy is all of the new. Uh, the, the the use of electronics in marching band, the use of electronics in the concert band. I mean, I was judging in a state that will remain anonymous, but uh, I, I heard all of these sounds. I mean, the band was about 30 people, but it sounded like a full, it sounded like, you know, a, a band of 80 people. And, and I, I couldn't believe, and, and finally I, I just got up from my chair and I looked at uh, you know, I looked over in the in the wings, and there was a uh, there was a kid playing synthesizer. You know what I mean? So the, the I think that's a real detriment to. I mean, the the basis of music education is teaching music. I mean, that's what the, that's what that term means, right? And so I always felt that teaching children to play instruments, uh, or to I mean, if you want to get broader, teaching them to sing or to play an instrument, you know, a string instrument, a wind instrument. Uh, that's, that's the basic of, basis of what we do. And the, the biggest threat to that is, is the overemphasis on competition and the, the use of, of, I mean, people trying to find alternative ways of, of becoming successful at being a music educator. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Do you mind, can I ask a follow-up to that? Sure. So when you speak of using electronics, you, you mean more to, to supplement what's already in the score as opposed to maybe a score that's written specifically for electronics and band? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, like uh, uh, a score. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, I'm not talking about a legitimate composer who uses, you know, certain, uses certain electronic instruments or using, uses a tape uh, sure, or sure. uses... Right. I mean, I'm not. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, marching bands that come on the field and they're using electronics to substitute for woodwinds or to substitute for low brasses or to substitute. I think if you want tuba players, you should teach tuba players. You shouldn't use, you know, an, uh, some sort of electronic bass. Sure, I understand. Okay, so Tom. If I could give you a time machine and set it to the day of your high school graduation, what advice would you give yourself? Maybe to be a little more focused, to study a little harder. Uh, I, I, I worked really hard at being a good pianist and being a good percussionist. I had a good piano teacher, but I didn't study a whole lot, you know. <laughs> 
I had a good theory background because I was a pianist, you know, and uh, I watched some of those guys, you know, that, that come into theory class and, oh, my goodness, you know, I felt so bad for them because neither could they hear nor could they read. You know, it was it was really tough for them. I mean, they couldn't read both clefs. And so uh, but but I would I would be a little more. uh I, I, my, I, I would be a little more focused on, on the study of other, of, of being a more well-rounded individual as I've tried to be in my, my later years, you know, uh, to, uh, to be, uh, more, you know, to, to have studied a little more in history and English and those kinds of classes. You know, I remember in, in English class one time, English 301, the, Teacher walked in and she said, uh, now, before tomorrow, I want you to read the first 300 pages of the Iliad. And I went, the first 300 pages? I've not, I had hardly ever read a newspaper, much this 300 pages of a, of a book, you know what I mean, in one day. So, I mean, it, it, I, would, I would give that advice to myself. I would uh, be a little more focused on, on being, a, you know, more, more well-rounded all right tom if you had a choice what would be the final work for wind ensemble or band that you'd want to conduct or perform oh wow that's really hard you know i looked at that and i was trying to think of that today there's so many great works out <laughs> sure. there today there's so many people writing really good works i I, I I don't really know. I, I you know I have a very close friend who is a composer, Luigi Zaninelli, who for you know whom I've known for years and years. And Luigi and I worked at the university together, and I commissioned him to write works, and he wrote for the band without my commissioning uh, him. And and you know he has one uh, uh, um, he has several several works uh, that are that are just absolutely. Uh, Blended that that uh, you know that that I I would think that I would I would like to conduct. Uh, you know, you always think of those that you would like to conduct again. But uh, uh, he uh, he has uh, a new one called Forbidden Fruit. You know, but he has one called Roma Sacra that's just absolutely a wonderful piece that uh, is is a great piece that I would like to do. You know, Tom, is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? No, not really. Okay. I don't have, I, I, you know, I have, I have, I have to, I have, I have several things that are in my family that are important to, to me that are coming up and, uh, uh, but no, not really as far as my, you know, profession, uh, not, not, uh, really, I, I, I work, you know, pretty hard at the, at the secretary treasurer's uh, job with the ABA, that takes a, a significant amount of time. It's a daily process, and uh, that uh, that the ABA is a very important organization. I think that people don't know enough about it, and I don't, you know, I don't know how, uh, other than to promote the archive, you know, and to promote the website and to promote the, the like like we were talking about the 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 uh, you know the 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 uh, the uh, uh, oh, good recordings mm -hmm. that 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 Vin Navarro had put together uh, that that's that's just a splendid thing for for young band directors or for a band directors period to go back and listen to uh, Ravelli and Carl King and you know those people uh, Freddie Grofe and uh, just to hear the concepts that they had. You know, oral history is a, a really important thing. And I, I, I Gellis, thank goodness, Don Gellis, you know, uh, thought of doing that at the time that he did. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking forward to going and listening to those. Yeah, yeah, you you, you should, because I think you would really enjoy them. Uh, I, I, I know you would, particularly, you know, Fay And, of course, Grofe was, you know, uh, a, he was one of the composers on that. I, I can't think of others on there now, but there are, there are some really, you know, some very, very interesting people on there. Tom, how can people get in touch with you? Well, they can get in touch with me best through the ABA website. Uh, the Thomas, it can say, you know, uh, contact us 
and my information is there. Tom, thank you so much for your time. Well, I have enjoyed talking to you, yes, and I think, uh, you know, you're doing a great service to our profession, and I look forward to uh, hearing it. 